On the road to Canaan, the Israelites get an interesting taste of God's method of salvation. As Moses instructs them, look and live. On the Bible Brief. The people of Israel are on the move. Kadesh behind them and the promised land before them. They've been wandering in the wilderness for nearly 40 years, and the time is coming for them to finally enter the land of Canaan. That land first promised to Abraham as part of the Abrahamic covenant, involving land, seed, and blessing. The land of Canaan, seed in abundance, and blessing to the world through a particular seed of Abraham. Part of that promise was being fulfilled in the people themselves. They had become the seed in abundance, but they were laser-focused on the first part, land. A land flowing with milk and honey. A land for all their livestock and crops. A land to call home after not just 40 years in the wilderness, but over 400 years since Jacob and his sons moved to Egypt during the famine. It had been a long time, and that time was almost up. But first, the last of the prior generation had to fulfill their judgment. They were to die in the wilderness before their sons could enter the land. Many of them had, but none so important as the high priest. None so important as Aaron. Shortly after leaving Kadesh, Aaron is dead. The first high priest of Israel is dead without ever having set foot in the land of Canaan. For his part in dishonoring Yahweh at the waters of Meribah, he died in the wilderness. Unbelief and disobedience have their costs, and in this case, The cost was steep. Miriam had died too here in the wilderness. Remember, she was Moses' sister who had helped him as an infant, who had resisted him as an adult, and yet who was loved with the kind of love only a brother can give a sister. Moses was alone now among his siblings, surely mourning their loss. He would now lead the nation without their companionship and kinship. The older generation was giving way to the new. Aaron's son, Eliezer, had replaced him as the new high priest of Israel. And soon Moses would have a replacement too. A new leader who would guide this wandering nation into their home in the land. But not yet. Not before a trek around the land that would mean battle after battle. And God would show himself to the people as the military might of the nation. While the people of Israel are ready to enter the land of Canaan, the nations in and around them are not. They've seen and they've heard of this wandering nation, whose God delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians, only to have them wander in the wilderness for years. They'd heard of Yahweh, but they didn't heed what they had heard. Instead, as soon as Israel leaves Kadesh, these nations begin their attacks and their resistance. Moses' plan was to lead the nation through the land of Edom before entering into Canaan on what was called the King's Highway, a common trade route. Now, Edom, if you remember, was the nation that came from Esau, the brother of Jacob, a nation that was on at least friendly to ambivalent terms with Israel hundreds of years prior. Now, this was a nation positioned southeast of the land of Canaan, so Moses apparently wanted Israel to enter the area of Canaan from the southeast or the east. Forty years prior, they had attempted entrance to the land from the south, but suffered an embarrassing defeat. So Moses decided on a different course than what the rebels had tried 40 years prior, as they disobeyed God and went into the land. He'd use this trade route of the king's highway to lead the people to the edge of Canaan. So to prepare, he had sent messengers from Israel to Edom to ask for safe passage through their land while they were on the king's highway. But Edom responded in an unexpected fashion. Let's listen to the messengers as they appeal to Edom in Numbers 21 starting in verse 14. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, You know all the hardship that we have met, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we lived in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom said to him, 
you shall not pass through, lest I come out with the sword against you. And the people of Israel said to him, We will go up by the highway, and if we drink your water, I and my livestock, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But Edom said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. Around 500 years before, Esau had given Jacob a kind and welcoming homecoming after he had been away from Canaan for decades. But the nation that came from Esau didn't welcome the nation that came from Jacob in the same way. Instead of hospitality, it was hostility. So Moses reconsiders his route. The way into Canaan will still be from the east, but they'll have to go around the whole land of Edom, a significant trek that would add many miles of desert roads to the journey. Instead of the king's highway, he would take another route, further south and stretching further east, before coming back the direction of Canaan. But the resistance from Edom was only exceeded by the aggression of their next rival. We read this in Numbers 21, verse 21. When the Canaanite, the king of Arid, who lived in the Negeb in the south of the land of Canaan, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah. The first battle commences as a Canaanite king sends his army against this wandering nation. He sees them beginning to set out on their journey, and he picks a vulnerable moment of attack. After taking some of the Israelites captive, Israel then vows to Yahweh that if he will give them victory, that they will utterly destroy the cities of this Canaanite king. Yahweh listens to their plea, and Israel quickly defeats their enemy. And here we see a small linguistic point we shouldn't miss. The place where they defeated the Canaanite king was called Hormah, meaning destruction. This location, Hormah, was the same location where Israel was utterly defeated 40 years prior. Doing things God's way turned the defeated into the victorious. The destruction at Hormah would now refer to the defeat of the Canaanites instead of Israel. Okay, so after this first battle, they continue to their trek to the eastern border of Canaan going around the territory of Edom. And it's on this journey that a remarkable event takes place, regarding, you guessed it, food and water. We read this in 22 verse 4. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water and we loathe this worthless food. Don't forget that these people had just experienced an amazing military victory against the Canaanites. You'd think that this caravan of Israel would be overwhelmed with expectation and thankfulness as they considered more victories in the future with Yahweh as their strength. But instead, they continued to complain for lack of food and water. Well, their lack of preferred food and water. They go so far as to call the manna that God has provided worthless food. This miracle bread from heaven was seen as worthless by the people. The response of God shouldn't surprise us. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Yahweh sends the serpents into the midst of the camp to afflict Israel for their lack of faith and for their complaining. And the people around the camp begin dying from these venomous serpents. But we should see the people's reaction here and see it in contrast to the other historical reactions to judgment. The people say clearly, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahweh and against you, Moses. And they ask Moses to pray for them that God would remove the serpents from among them. And God responds with some interesting instructions to Moses. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. 
So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is one of the iconic moments of healing in the whole of the Hebrew Bible. Iconic, perhaps, because of both the method and the requirement for healing. The method was to lift up a likeness of the very serpents afflicting the people on a pole. And the requirement was for the people of Israel to merely look at the bronze serpent on the pole, and they would be healed from their bites. Not only was a bronze serpent lifted up, but this serpent was emblematic of the very tempter back in the Garden of Eden. Quite an odd way of healing. Odd until we see someone else lifted up 1,500 years later. But this time, instead of a pole, he's lifted up on a cross. But that's for our next episode. At this location, despite the people's complaints, we have no record of God providing any additional food or water for the people. Apparently, they weren't actually in a state of need so much as they were in a state of discontentment. Discontentment can feel like need to someone who isn't grateful for everything God has already provided. But that doesn't mean that God wouldn't eventually provide when the people were truly in need. After additional traveling, they arrive at a place where God provides them water, a location called Beer, the Hebrew word for a well, like a water well. God apparently allows Moses and other leaders to find and easily dig a well with just their staves, like scratching the ground to produce water. In fact, this was such a meaningful experience that Israel made a song to commemorate the moment. They sang, Spring up, a well, sing to it, the well that the princes made, that the nobles of the people dug, with the scepter and with their staffs. The well at Beer would be a place long remembered as a place where God provided water to his needy people headed toward the promised land. But soon after leaving Beer, Israel again sends messengers to a king asking for passage through his land. Having gone the long way around the land of Edom, they were hoping to rejoin the king's highway trade route through the land of the Amorites. We read this in verse 21. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We will not turn aside into field or vineyard. We will not drink the water of a well. We will go by the king's highway until we have passed through your territory. But Sihon would not allow Israel to pass through his territory. He gathered all his people together and went out against Israel to the wilderness and came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. These Amorites, however, were no match for the Israelites, because Yahweh himself was with Israel. They fought against Israel, but the Amorites were handily defeated. So much so that the Israelites were able to conquer the whole territory of the Amorites and were able to settle there for a while as they considered their next move. But this settling was in a defensive posture. Another king from an area called Bashan sends his forces against Israel before being defeated as well. Yahweh provides victory for his people time and time again. First, some of the Canaanites, then the Amorites, and then these people from Bashan. Nations are beginning to rise up against the people of God, whether it's strong resistance like Edom or outright battle like the other nations. Israel is beginning to get a taste of their near future in the battles for the land of Canaan. They haven't yet entered the land, and there's hostility on every side. The people would need the strength of God if they were to stand a chance at all. And soon, they'll see God work in a new way on their behalf. At every step, God is vindicating His name. At every step, God is working for His people. And soon, Israel meets a new kind of enemy, a spiritual enemy of sorts, who attempts to curse this nation ready to enter the land. But how will God deal with curses? Simple, by turning them into blessings. Join us next time as we see how Jesus relates to the bronze serpent before we launch back into the story of Israel. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.